I'm Christine, and this is my husband, Ty. We're building a four-person airplane in our garage. We've never done this before, so we are learning as we go. And while we've occasionally found ourselves in some interesting situations, it has been a whole lot of fun to do together. Come join us as I share our experiences, tips and tricks we learn along the way, and other fun aviation adventures. Right, so we are back at it with the elevators and kicking off on 9-9 step one. After you have dimpled the flanges of the spars, it tells you that it could cause the flanges to bend slightly and to check the angles of them so that uh, it's gonna work out nicely when you got those skins attached. I just used a little piece of cardboard that I had and a uh, little protractor and marked off the angles and tried to use that uh, cut as precisely as I could to test the angle there. Another thing to keep in mind is, at least on the iPhones, they have a level that's in there. If you go under, I think it's called the Measure app, um, there's a little level. I have used that in a couple places. I think it normally works out better if there's more of a surface so you can kind of push it against. And here, the flanges are really very, uh, you know, they're quite small. But that's an option, too, to try and check on, um, on the angles when you're doing some of this stuff. Moving on, uh, there's a lot more dimpling that takes place until you get to step six there on 9-9, where now you are machine countersinking the holes on the trailing edges. So we had just got a drill press at this point in time, and when I went to go and start using it, found out that the table wasn't level, so I had to go and work around that for a bit and get that squared away and fixed. But the other thing is that we were using a countersinking jig that we got from Cleveland Tool, where they have cut a little notch into it that is just the right uh, shape and size for those trailing edge wedges to sit in. It just makes it a really nice, easy, flat surface to work with. And especially then hooking up there on the, um, the drill press, it made really fast, clean, easy work of countersinking those. But the biggest advantage of using the drill press with one of these countersinking jigs is that when you're countersinking these trailing edges, you are countersinking both sides of a very thin piece of aluminum because it's going to be receiving the dimpled skin from both the top and the bottom skins. And if you go back to my day 10 video where I was first countersinking the trailing edge for the rudder and I was just doing everything by hand, you can see where I ran into a problem with chatter because once you go and countersink the one side of the trailing edge, when you go to countersink the opposite side, the hole is gonna end up getting enlarged slightly when you're now cutting this, this bevel into the opposite side. And when that happens, there's nothing to help guide the tip of that countersink cutter in the, in the right place. So when that hole gets enlarged, that tip, if you're just holding it by hand on the drill can, just move around and end up where you have a problem with this chatter like you can see here in this picture from back when i did the rudder so when you have it though hooked up to the drill press and everything's clamped down you, you line up that cutter with the hole and then even though you're ending up enlarging that hole as you're cutting it because everything's hooked up and fixed in terms of its orientation using the drill press and clamping the piece of the table you aren't gonna have that same problem. Even though the hole's getting enlarged, it's still gonna cut it in the right place. It's gonna be nice and smooth and not have that chatter. So hopefully that makes sense. But again, big advantage, was able to easily just go through and knock all these out and not have any problems countersinking both trailing edges and both sides of them. Do you want me to move your topo over here so it didn't get shavings? Uh, yeah, but let me have a sip first. There's, I just saw big chunks next to your drink, and I didn't want you to be drinking aluminum. Appreciate it. I know it's mineral water, but let's not go that far. <laughs> 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 
he always keeps me laughing. Okay, so moving on, uh, it's a lot more of the this usual stuff about priming and prepping everything for riveting. The big thing to keep in mind is uh, mentioned there on 9-10, where if you are priming your skins, and let's not get into the priming debate, but if you are choosing to prime your skins, it says they're on step one of 9-10 to mask off the locations of the trailing edge foam rib so they will, will be bonded to bare aluminum. The big thing is, if you are priming, you don't want to have primer where those ribs are going to go because you don't want to have any problems with the adhesion of the ribs to the skin. So just make sure to mask that area off before you apply any primer if you're choosing to do so. One other thing I want to point out before we get off of 9-9 .9 is in step five, it tells you to dimple the top and bottom flanges of the E903 and E904 tip ribs for the skin dimples. You also need to dimple the forward flanges. So there's three holes on the forward flange of both of those tip ribs, and you need to go ahead and dimple those because on 9-7 step nine, it had us dimple all of the holes in the E913 counterbalance skin. And when you get to 9-10, in step three, where it's got you riveting the counterbalance skin to the tip ribs, it says to use 426 3 half rivets for all of those. So you are using countersunk rivets. You already did dimple the counterbalance skin. You just need to make sure to dimple also those uh, three holes in both the 903 and the 904 tip ribs to receive the, the dimples there on that counterbalance skin. But now we're getting started on the riveting, and for some reason, I am missing the video from riveting the tip ribs and the elevator horns. Um, I'm not sure what happened there, but I don't remember there being anything particularly um, noteworthy. The only thing I'll say, let's see here, when we're riveting the nut plates and the reinforcement plates to the skins, is I was able to just use the pneumatic squeezer through the hole to set all of those. Personal preference, I just, I really like to use the pneumatic squeezer whenever I can. And now we're back riveting all of the ribs onto the skins. And a couple things here that I remember. Uh, the first is that, you know, because you've got this big long skin and this small little back rivet plate, the skin curves over the plate um, where you have it underneath it. So what I mean is that the skin that's above that back rivet plate is it sitting perfectly flat. It's it's curved uh, because the rest of it's sitting there flat on the table. And because you're doing the back riveting and nothing's there clicoing it in place, uh, it was important for us to really make sure to push down on the rib that we were riveting to make sure that the rib and the skin were sitting flush against that back rivet plate. Um, we did have a couple rivets we had to go and drill out because I think they ended up sitting a little proud of the skin because I think that skin was curving a little bit. Um, and then the other thing was that on the bigger half of the ribs, so the one with the cute little smiley face I mentioned in the last video, um, the little smiley face bit got in the way a little bit of the beehive on the rivet gun. And so what I found is that if I started riveting on the smaller end or the aftmost end of that larger rib half and then worked my way forward, that when I got to that little spot, I could just kind of gently push the little smiley face bit out of the way and then go and rivet that one um, rivet that's at the forwardmost end of the rib. When you're riveting those rear spars on there afterwards, you can use the squeezer for the whole thing. You just have to move that aft end of the skin like to the edge there of the table so it can flex a little bit because otherwise it's in the way of you being able to get the squeezer to fit in there. Um, like the, the actual bulk of the squeezer won't fit, but if you just pull it up to the edge of the table, it'll flex and get out of your way enough that you can just use the squeezer on the whole thing. All right, moving on to 9-12, there's a couple things here. The first thing is on step five, where it's told you now how to rivet the bottom skin on the left elevator, it says at the end of that instruction to repeat step five for the second flange of the rear spar and the top skin of the right elevator. The one thing it doesn't specifically mention here, but that you need to keep in mind is like, just like back in step two, where it told you don't install the, the rivets along the spar in the area of the trim tab cutout because that's where that trim tab hinge is going to be attached later. Uh, same applies over here now on this top skin for the right elevator. So just make sure not to um, go ahead and install any rivets there where that hinge is going to go because you're just going to have to drill them out <laughs> later. The other thing is that we 
we opted to do things a little bit differently here in terms of order of operations, and here's why. When we got to step four and it told us to position the skin and then to uh, clico the rib halves to each other and to clico the skin to the rear spar, Tyler suddenly looks at everything after we clicoed it together and goes, I don't think that that pneumatic blind rivet gun is going to fit in there. And sure enough, we got it out and we tried to test it. It's like, huh. Nope, not going to fit to reach the two holes, the two aftmost holes there in the rib halves. So we got out the manual one and that one did fit, but I was having flashbacks to working on the rudder. And I don't know if y'all remember, but we were having problems when we were using that manual rivet gun with the mandrel breaking before the rivet was fully set. And then we had to go and try and knock it out and drill it out. And I'm sitting here going, how the heck am I going to get in there if I have that problem again? And I've already riveted the skin to the spar, and now I've got to try and figure out how to drill out a rivet that doesn't set. And so what, what we opted to do to try and prevent any crazy issues is that we did the elevators more like how it had us do the rudder. And so what I mean by that is we clicoed one set of rib halves together, and then we went in with the pneumatic blind rivet gun and riveted them together. And then we would just gently keep folding down one at a time the different ribs and mating them up. And so what this allowed us to do is because it was still open on one end because that skin was folded back, I had ample room to get in there with the um, pneumatic blind rivet gun and get everything set. And that way, if I had any issues, I also had ample space to be able to go and uh, drill anything out. Um, and then after we did that, then we went back and we riveted the skins on with the special bucking bar uh, to, the, to the rear spar. So that was just a personal choice that we opted to make uh, just to work around the tools that we had and trying to prevent issues that we'd already had in the past from repeating themselves now. <laughs> And here are the funny faces that I mentioned last time. Okay, tell me that does not look like a pair of googly eyes and a big wide open mouth. I think that's hilarious. And here we are using that um, specially modified bucking bar to now rivet the other flange of the rear spar to the opposite skin. And let me tell you what, that thing worked out great. Um, we did not make one per the Vans instructions. We instead bought the one that uh, Cleveland Tool Artie sells that's, that's already pre-made. And that thing worked out great. The flashlight did come in handy for helping to make sure that I had the bar lined up properly on the rivet that we were trying to set. Um, the other thing is that for this part you're in the when you were doing the other side of the spar you had the spar clamped to the edge of the table while you were doing the riveting here you don't have that right now and so what we did is we grabbed some of our like weights and just set some light weights on top of the um elevator and then in front of it just to help keep it from sliding around and the weights are sitting on top of the actual ribs there to not cause any issues with the uh with messing around with the skins but that just helped kind of keep it from sliding around since it wasn't clamped to the table for this step on to 9-13 and we've got the front spars now getting clicoed and riveted to everything and I'll tell you what here, you can really see how helpful it is having two people because of the way we were able to tag team this. So Tyler got one of them clicoed and I started riveting and then he starts clicoing the other one. And then when I go to rivet that one, he's popping the clicos out of the first one and putting in the new rivets. And I mean, it just made it work like a really well-oiled machine. It's super nice having both of us working on it. The rest of 9-13 really wasn't so bad. Um, the squeezer worked out great for getting the flanges of the front spar attached to the skins, but 9-14 parts of that, it just was not my friend. <laughs> um, I wasn't happy, especially with getting the um, tip rib assembly attached there. It, oy, it was just, it was such like a tight squeeze. It was frustrating because even though everything had already been put together and um final drilled we had a hard time getting uh all the holes to line up trying to get the clecos in trying to get rivets to fit 
uh, trying to get the rivet gun in, even with a double offset rivet set there, trying to get my hands in there to hold the bucking bar to buck the rivets as we're setting them. I mean, it's just, oh, and then, and then when you're trying to check the rivets, again, you can't get the gauge in there. So you're doing the trick I mentioned before um, that our tech advisor taught us about using your fingertip and pushing it against the shop head there and testing against the rivet gauge. So it was just, it was such a tight squeeze and just so awkward to work with that it was just, it was very frustrating. But I mean, in the end, we got it done. It worked. I did find that I couldn't get my hand in there holding the bucking bar like in a fist like I would normally do when we're bucking the rivets. Uh, I ended up having to basically just use my fingertips and either uh, like here you can see supporting it from both the top and the bottom, supporting the bucking bar with just my fingertips uh, or um, on some of them I was able to just support it from one side and not the other, but it, it just very, very tight squeeze. And I'm not sure if like part of the problem with trying to get some of the holes to line up was from like the primer, if there was maybe too much that had gotten in any of the holes. Um, but it, it was just super tight to try and get everything in there. And you don't have a lot of room to work with and it's dark because <laughs> everything's already already closed. Um, I did find, and maybe this was just a placebo effect to make me feel better. I don't know. But normally, you know, you click all the parts together and then you put the rivets in to go and do the riveting. But on a couple of these where there was maybe only two or three holes that were holding two components together that we were about to rivet, I found that it was a little easier if I put a rivet in first and then I put a Clico in to whatever the opposite hole was that I wasn't riveting right away. Again, I don't know, maybe, maybe that's not a thing. Maybe that was just something in my head that made me feel better, like it was a little more successful. Who knows? But at least it made me feel better at the time. Take that for what you will. Next up was step seven there on 9-14, or what Tyler called arts and crafts time, uh, <laughs> where you're taking out the foam blocks and you're cutting out the images on 9-21 to make the trailing edge ribs there. Very straightforward, besides the fact that you're working in a totally different medium for the first time. Uh, spray on glue, stick it on there, let it dry, bandsaw worked great. Uh, everything worked out nice and easy, which was a refreshing change after having just had the problems and the frustration with those uh, tip rib assemblies. Once the foam ribs were cut out and ready to go, it was time for our second ever Pro Seal Day. <laughs> and I'm very happy to report that this went a lot better than the first one doing the trailing edge for the rudder. Uh, I think there was just a lot less stress, a lot less anxiety because now we'd already worked with it once before. We knew how it worked. We knew what to expect. We knew that it wasn't just going to set right away. We knew we had like good amount of time to go and work with everything. Um, it went a lot easier. Uh, right here, I'm just using some wax paper on cardboard with a popsicle stick for mixing it and scraping it all out. I have some better suggestions on what to do now with the Pro Seal, but I'm going to hold off on that until we get to the fuel tanks video, uh, just because you're not going to see any of it here in this one. And so it'll make more sense than, I guess, looking at it in the future. But one thing I will say is that I think a good idea is to designate one shirt as your Pro Seal shirt, because Pro Seal definitely has a knack for getting on everything somehow. And I got very lucky. I didn't ruin this Oshkosh shirt that I really like. Um, but just pick one shirt that's going to be your Pro Seal shirt and just wear that one on the different uh, Pro Seal days so you don't end up ruining a bunch of clothes while you're doing this. But once we got the foam ribs inserted with the Pro Seal on them and we got the trailing edges inserted there with the Pro Seal on them, we took both of the elevators and put them back to back there on the table. So I mean with the two counterbalance ends uh, facing each other. And we took out the piece of aluminum angle that I'd mentioned in the rudder video that our tech advisor had loaned us that he'd made where the holes are cut into it at the same spacing that they're in the trailing edge. And so what we're able to do is line up the edges of the elevators with that aluminum angle, Clico the trailing edge of both elevators into the aluminum angle. And it's just a little bit of extra support to help hold everything nice and straight uh, while it's curing. We then put the big uh, wood block on top, just like it had in the instructions with all of the weights on it to just double down on everything and making sure it holds it really nice and straight and flush and flat while it's curing. 
while we were waiting for the pro seal to cure, we ended up working on the trim tabs, but I'm going to cover that in a separate video because we did have a problem that came up and ended up redoing them. Um, but from calling vans when we went to reorder the parts, apparently this is a really common problem for people to have to redo the trim tabs. Um, I figured out what the problem was for us and there was a very easy solution for it. But just because of that, I'm going to cover the trim tabs in a separate video and just stick with doing the elevators for the rest of this video. So after the pro seal had cured, um, we were getting ready to do the double flush riveting on the trailing edges. And so I hooked up the reamer to the drill to just clear out the holes there to make sure that any extra pro seal was out so that the rivets would sit nice and flush in there. And I also got out a little bit of acetone just to clean up again on the surface and a little bit on the edge there where there was a little extra pro seal. And then we once again got out the steel angle that our tech advisor had loaned to us that he recommended for doing the riveting there of the trailing edge. So you're able to use that to buck uh, while you're setting the rivets. And it's nice because it, you just clamp it there to the edge of the table and it goes the full length along whatever piece of trailing edge you're working with. It's very nice. Um, the technique I think that we found after looking around online for some different tips and suggestions for setting the double flush rivets was to start with the back rivet set on the rivet gun and then to finish with the flush rivet set. So I'd start with the back rivet set and have it like square to the rivet and then start to angle it a little bit more so it's more square to the um, skin as I'm riveting and then finish it off with a flush rivet set to really get it nice and, and uh, smooth and flush there with the skin. So that was just a technique that I remember reading about online. And so we tried it and that just for us, cause we tried a couple just doing with the flush rivet set and tried a couple just doing with the back rivet set. Personally, that just seemed to be the way kind of doing a little bit of both that it seemed to work out nicer for us. After the riveting came the rolling of the skins. And as you might remember, if you watched the rudder video, uh, there was the whole inner diameter, outer diameter PVC pipe fiasco. Um, I thought about trying this broom handle. It was one of these things where, hey, it happened to be about the right length. It looked like it was about the right diameter. Um, going with trying to do the super exact precise, uh, PVC hadn't worked out super well. And it's like, you know what? We're just, we're going to try it and see how it goes. So that's what we did. Got out the screwdriver, detached the broom handle from the broom and ended up going with that. The instructions do say in step three to make sure to make the slight bend along the leading edge of the top skin. So it'll lay flush on the bottom skin after rolling and riveting. Uh, yeah, definitely don't miss this because we'll see after you get it all rolled, there is like no way that you'd be able to get one of those edge forming tools in there. So there's no kind of going back after the fact. Make sure you don't miss that. I don't think you can really have too much duct tape here in this step. Um, it mentions going back and doing everything for the rolling edges the same way you did for the rudder. And it has the different instructions in section five on how to do it. Um, and I just used a lot of tape, a lot of duct tape to really try and get it secured really well to the broom handle that we were using. And then just like it says there in the instructions with the, um, we use device grips then on the edges of the broom handle to really help crank it and get it in there and going one section at a time when you were trying to roll everything instead of doing all of it at once. Okay. You better not post that to me. I'm in no mood, I already told you. Oh, and putting a little bit of duct tape on the broom handle where we had the vice grips um, clamped to it seemed to help with a little bit better grip and a little less slipping of the vice grips on the handle. But this went really, really well. I think that this one, we just, it, everything seemed to work really nicely that the first time. Again, who knows? Maybe it's like with Pro Seal or same thing. Having already done it once, it's a little bit easier to go back and do again but no major issues here on this one. They came together really nicely. 
All right, so now we're on to 9-15 step eight where we are trimming the counterweights there. If you look on figure three, it has the shaded areas where you're supposed to trim everything. So on the diagram on the right, it says to remove the raised shaded portion from only two weights. That is a very narrow piece that you are trimming off of a already narrow side of that counterweight. And I did not want to hold that by hand. I did not want my fingers to be that close to the blade while we were doing any of this cutting. So I got out some scrap wood and a clamp and clamped the pieces to the side and used that to help guide the counterweight through to trim that, uh, that narrow sliver off. This also turned out to be a really good idea for another reason, because afterwards when I went and touched the uh, counterweight when I was done, it was really hot. So um, even if you weren't afraid of the blade, <laughs> it will get really hot during this part. Just something to keep in mind. For the other two cuts to trim off a little bit on the top and the bottom, that wasn't an issue. I was able to hold it by hand then and to just trim those two little parts off and had no issues there. In the next step, step nine, you're now attaching these counterweights to the tip ribs using the hardware there in figure four. And the little problem that we ran into here is that we couldn't actually get the AN3-13A bolts through all of the holes in all four of these counterweights. I don't know if it's that they weren't quite exactly the right size or if there was, uh, it looked like some little bits of area where the holes were a little obstructed, especially on the two where we'd remove the raised shaded portion. The material's really soft for the weight, so I don't know if it just kind of blocked it off a little bit, but what I ended up doing to try and fix this and to make sure everything matched up really well is I'd set one of the counterweights into the slot where it was supposed to go on the tip rib, look at which hole lined up the best with the holes in the tip rib that you're supposed to connect it with. I would run the drill through that hole with a number 12 drill bit on it. I'd put the bolt then through that hole in the counterweight and then also put the bolt through the corresponding hole there in the tip rib and then I'd clamp it down. And I'd clamp it down and then end up final drilling basically from the tip rib side into the counterweight, the second hole, just to make sure that when the holes were getting cleared out on the counterweights that they did match up just right with the holes there in the tip ribs for the bolts to go through. I think I had to do this on three of the counterweights. I seem to recall that with one of them, I didn't have any problems that it went through just fine. But I think on three of them, we had problems trying to get the bolts to go in and I ended up having to do this. But after that and doing a little bit of final drilling there on the holes in the counterweights, everything matched up just fine without any issues. All right, so that wraps up the elevators minus the trim tabs. Like I said, I'm going to do a separate video just for the trim tabs. Um, but I've now done a couple different videos that are all at this longer, more closer to a half hour length and wanted to get some input from y'all on if you are preferring these longer format videos or would you rather that I do the shorter ones again, closer to the 15 minute length and put those out instead of these longer 30 minute videos. So please leave me a comment down below. Let me know what your thoughts are now after having done a couple of these longer format videos. And again, if you're interested, don't forget that there is now a Plain Lady Patreon and the link is below if you'd like to help support my channel that way. But thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please be sure to give me a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe to my channel if you haven't already done so for more videos like these and to follow along as we build our RV tech.